This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom again with our ongoing series, Nuclear Free Future Conversation. And viewers, please welcome with me our returning guests, Maggie Gunderson, the president, the founding president of Fairwinds Energy Education, and Arnie Gunderson, the chief engineer of Fairwinds Energy Education. And when you were here the last time, Maggie and Arnie, you were preparing to go, Arnie, to Japan for the, uh, the trip to Japan. And let me say before we go, go into that, that it's a portentous month in March here, in March 2012, because it is almost one year since the triple meltdown of Fukushima Daiichi. And also on March 21st here in Vermont is the date of the scheduled closing of Energy Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Plant according to the vote of the people of Vermont. So this is a very, very important time and uh, the viewers and I want to know, Arnie, why, why did you go to Japan? And uh, what did you learn there? And what do they learn from you? Um, well, thank you for having us, by the way. Um, I went to Japan uh, for a week as a, uh, a guest of a publishing company called Shueisha, and uh, uh, they published an interview with Maggie and I um, that they did several months ago. And uh, so there's a, a book out in Japanese only uh, with my smiling picture on the cover, yeah. and it's, um, uh, it's on the newsstands in Japanese only. Um, and the reason for the timing of it was exactly like you said. It's that the, um, uh, the accident occurred essentially a year ago, March 11th, and um, they wanted to, um, uh, to inform the Japanese that uh, what the accident really uh, uh, caused and then also um, that there are alternatives. So uh, what this says is um, uh, Fukushima uh, Daiichi, and it's the truth and the future. Okay. So it's a, it's a look ahead at alternatives to these huge nuclear generators um, and uh, that the, the Japanese do have alternatives that can be non-nuclear if they choose. Okay, and, pr and we have titled this, this program Fukushima Daiichi, An Accident Waiting to Happen. Now, uh, you address that in the book and you've addressed that issue in a lot of your writing and interviews. And can you tell me what, how is, why did, why did this happen? And uh, Maggie, please help us on no, this. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, it happened in part because of mechanical things and a tsunami, but really at the bottom of it was a, um, just a, a total breakdown in organization. That the, the Japanese knew this was happening and because of something we call the echo effect, the, the industry and the um, regulators are, um, uh, are, are sharing the same story, which is not necessarily accurate. Um, what we were able to show in the book and, and then separately in this uh, the report that we put together after the book came out um, is that um, the, the, the regulators really aren't regulating, not just in Japan, but, but worldwide. And, they knew that a tsunami could occur, um, and yet they did nothing to prevent it. Um, they knew that the Mark I containment was weak, and yet they continued not just to run it for 40 years, but then they gave it a license extension. Some of this is in your Greenpeace report. You have a report that is part of a, of a, uh, of a Greenpeace report for the Greenpeace International, and, and uh, your, yours is entitled The Echo Chamber Effect, right? Yes. And in that, you, you report that only a month before they had gotten the, the, um, the watchdog agency uh, equivalent to the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the United States, had gotten a report that Fukushima Daiichi could not sustain an earthquake of, of that uh, power. It actually started 20 years before and then <laughs> 10 years before, and then three or four years before, and actually eight days before the, the tsunami hit, the um, TEPCO, the owner of the power plant, convinced the Japanese regulators that there really wasn't enough data on this tsunami and they needed to study it further, and that until the studies were done, they didn't have to do anything to the power plant. 
So this is a 20-year history, at least, and maybe even beyond that, that the authorities have known and Tokyo Electric has known and still decided to do one more study and one more study to avoid spending the money to repair the plant. So you're telling me that TEPCO made that decision themselves, that they, there was, they decided, well, there was nothing to do. But who, who is the oversight agency? Do they have anybody to answer to? Well, there's two. There's, there's NAIS, which, which is uh, the um, National Atomic... NISA. NISA, I'm sorry, NISA. Sorry, um, flipping my acronyms. Um, uh, um, which is their um, regulator like the NRC in Japan. Mm -hmm. And then there's the International IAEA. And, but the International IAEA is not a regulator. It's chartered by Congress, uh, by uh, the UN. And its t mission under that charter is to promote nuclear power worldwide. And everyone thinks the IAEA is um, regulating, and they are the ones who said repeatedly that the Japanese had the best um, tsunami protection and earthquake seismic protection in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And There's yeah. nothing on the record within the United States or within the IAEA records that before the earthquake, anybody expressed any reservations about these power plants. Um, of course, as soon as the earthquake occurred, now everybody says, well, it's the Japanese system. It can't happen here. Um, but it was interesting. In the heat of the moment, the uh, NRC released some emails just, uh, just this week. And um, one of the NRC senior staffers blurted out that the Mark I containment is the worst containment design he's ever seen. Now, for 40 years, everybody's known that, but everybody's ignored it. And, um, and, and yet, literally on the 12th, one day after the accident, the NRC is saying in their own private emails that this, this is the worst containment that's ever been designed. And isn't it correct that that's the same, that Fukushima Mark I design is the same as Vermont Yankee and the same as 23 other plants in this country? That's right. Breathtaking, isn't it? It is breathtaking. And uh, it, it's so alarming because the IAEA also continued, when they went in to monitor the, the meltdown, they continued to issue statements saying that Japan was, uh, TEPCO, was handling the disaster in, very, very, in, in a very good way. And yet, according to the Greenpeace report, Again, it's, a, it's an example of their rubber stamping what the owner is doing and uh, saying that it, it's okay. And yet, according to the Greenpeace report, there are so many horrible things that happened that we, uh, we are not aware of. And uh, for example, I read in, in the report that um, Greenpeace went in to, uh, to measure the radiation even before the, I, the IAEA didn't even go in for, for several days, and the Greenpeace was already there measuring the radiation. Right. And, mm. and the industry, the Japanese industry, and the NRC, and the IAEA were all condemning Greenpeace's readings as false, and they were quite accurate, quite accurate. And as a matter of fact, the Japanese um, kept the Rainbow Warrior at least 20 miles away from the shore. That's their boat that they were trying to get in and Greenpeace find out the Pacific. contamination that was in the, um, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean. So Greenpeace had a boat and they wanted to bring it in and get good readings. And the Japanese um, um, exercised their sovereignty and kept uh, Greenpeace from getting good data. Mm -hmm. Despite that, uh, Greenpeace had the first volunteers on the ground and um, accurately was measuring stuff um, days and weeks before the IAEA. The report says the IAEA came in, agreed with Greenpeace, and then changed their mind two days later and said, oh no, it's really not a problem, under pressure from the Japanese. From the uh, Japanese government, not uh, the people, but the government. I mean, one of the things that startled me is after you know, 10 months of showing real, real problems, in December, the IAEA, and substantiated 
TEPCO's false announcement of a cold shutdown. And Arnie can speak to the, the technical aspects of that, but it's impossible to have cold shutdown. This, this plant can't be totally turned off. All the mechanisms for doing that are broken. Yeah, the, the nuclear core, when you have a cold shutdown, assumes that the nuclear core is in the nuclear reactor. And that, of course, doesn't happen if you have a meltdown. If the nuclear core is not in the reactor, it's impossible to have a, a cold shutdown. And yet, um, when, when Tokyo Electric announced it, um, the uh, IAEA said, isn't this great? The United States Department, State, State Department said, isn't this great? Um, everybody just kind of jumped on the bandwagon to make this problem go away. And are they sticking to the story that they do have a cold shutdown at the moment? Uh, there's been some near misses in the last couple months, and people are talking about, well, it's cold shutdown, but it's very fragile. And that's the Japanese have actually said, well, it's fragile, but it's cold shutdown. And those two words don't go together. Cold shutdown means stable, fragile means fragile. Um, mm -hmm. So um, basically, it was designed to, to placate a bunch of people and make the Japanese think the issue's over, which is one of the reasons why I went over there, you know, was to, to tell them the truth. What happened, that the regulator uh, was, was cozy with, uh, with Tokyo Electric, and that the plant design was inadequate from the start, and that everybody knew a tsunami was likely. And uh, I think um, I was really well received at the Japanese press club, and uh, I also met with the Japanese uh, Bar Association, and um, about 10 other publications in, in hour-long interviews while I was over there. Um, and it was a message they need to hear, and I was glad I could do it. And the people are hungry for the truth. Isn't that so? I mean, they, they are so distrustful of what the authorities have been telling them since the meltdown, and that the emergency planning uh, situation was dismal at the, at the, uh, the t at, on March 11th. And in the days afterwards, one of the most distressing things I read in the Greenpeace report was that they didn't provide the potassium iodine to the people who were the most susceptible to the radiation. And that, tell, tell us about the potassium iodine. Mm -hmm. Well, the potassium iodide is a, a pill that uh, can prevent um, iodine, the radioactive iodine, from being absorbed into your thyroid your thyroid will suck in the iodine that's released, and the potassium iodide will fill that in ahead of time so that you know, children's thyroids especially cannot be compromised. They had um, 10 days where they debated whether they should even put this out there and let people have it, and then they decided they would, and then it was delivered to the prefecture and to the different towns. And then they said, oh, no, don't give it out yet. We might upset the people and they'll get worried. Well, you need to have that in the first 24 to 48 hours to fill the, the thyroid with um, safe iodine. And that wasn't done. That wasn't done. And, and there's a similar issue here in the U.S. Under President Bush, he took steps in certain areas of the country, recalled their, their supplies of potassium iodide because he did not want the nuclear industry to be um, viewed as um, uh, a threat to anyone's right. health. I, I well remember that, and uh, because I was in the New York City area, at uh, Indian Point, about three miles, I believe Indian Point is from New York City, and uh, they, they, everybody was clamoring for the potassium iodine because they were afraid. We were afraid of the uh, terrorist threat. Of, uh, of bombing the nuclear power plant. And that was the reason that President George W. Bush withdrew the potassium iodine because he said he didn't want the people to be alarmed. Right. Not to worry. Not to worry. Yeah. And now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is saying, well, maybe we should make plans to get potassium iodide out beyond 10 miles after Fukushima. Taking a year after Fukushima and taking 40 years for those of us who thought the, the tablet should be readily available. But now, finally, the NRC is saying, my God, we might need them out beyond 10 miles. We better stock more. I can't remember the NRC inspector's name. I don't know if you remember it, but there was a particular NRC inspector who went to the mat about the potassium iodide. He um, had done all this research, and he tried to get um, the NRC to reg you know, recommend that this was out there and to put it out there and to get it in every town near a nuclear plant. And because they didn't want to alarm, and this is like 
20 years ago. Yeah. Um, did they even, they fired him, didn't they, at first? I think. Oh, they put him in a corner office for the rest of his career. Yeah, and didn't like, but he, I mean, he really was a whistleblower in bringing this issue forward. And I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, his name off the top of my head, but I really commend his effort. Well, so far now with, with this, we're learning that the emergency planning was so bad in Japan that the, uh, the treatment of the people, that, that politics went above the, the concern for the health and safety of the people. And that this was, was uh, definitely augmented by the oversight agency, NISA, right? NISA. And NISA, yeah. N-I-S-A. And now, when you were there, Arnie, uh, were the people aware of all of this when, when you were speaking to the audiences there or what? Well, the, when I talked to the Japanese press club, um, about the close association between Tokyo Electric and their, their own legislature, uh, there were a lot of smiling, nodding faces. They all recognized that, that Tokyo Electric is the big dog and the, um, um, and the legislature does what Tokyo Electric wants. You know, the, the other example is in compensation of victims, which the Greenpeace report talks about as well. The, um, uh, they don't have Price Anderson which is the, the nuclear insurance policy here in the United States, where utilities have very little um, uh, to lose if there's a nuclear accident. Right now, all of Tokyo Electric is on the hook and uh, is likely to be nationalized. But Tokyo Electric doesn't want that to happen, and uh, they're pushing really hard within the legislature to get cash infusions from the state without being nationalized. But the, the, the reason um, they're hemorrhaging is because they've got thousands and tens of thousands of people who need these uh, payments. And yet a, a lot of them, um, after six months out of their home, they're given a token $1,000 payment to try to make up for the losses. Mm -hmm. And they have to sign legally that, that's, that they will never come after any additional money, that they accept the thousand dollars as payment covering all their damages and these are people families who have had these farm properties you know like vermonters they're 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 connected to their land they've had these farm properties for seven generations and they've lost their farms people are talking about some some people in the japanese government are saying oh they'll be back in 30 to 40 years after the cleanup but it's you have to take the half-lives. It's 300 to 400 years before this, this land will be um, livable again and usable. And these are the people that had to be evacuated and also right. people who evacuated themselves. Right. Right. And they're in a different position also. Well, if you evacuated yourself, there's no compensation. They're basically saying, that's your problem. You didn't have to go. And the ones that did evacuate have to fill out a 60-page form and attach receipts to get any compensation at all. So clearly, um, you know, there, there's no, the, at the end of the day, the, um, the average Japanese is going to never be compensated for the accident. The other piece of Japanese law is that um, you can only declare damages up to 20 years, and a lot of cancers occur at 20 or 30 years. So if you get cancer, that's now latent, but is, is going to develop late in your life, um, you, can't, uh, you can't go back and get compensated for that either. And this all goes hand in hand with the dismissal of the dangers of radiation to the population. And the, the, uh, the reports that come to our, our popular press all the time denigrating the, the dangers of radiation and telling us that everything is okay and even even just today, I saw a, uh, an, a piece in the New York Times saying that uh, the health impacts a year after Fukushima indicate that uh, radioactive materials released in Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns will probably be too small to be easily measured, according to experts assemb assembled by the Health Physics Society for a panel discussion on Thursday. This is last Thursday. And the area cordoned off by the Japanese government as uninhabitable is probably far too large, the experts said. So this is directly... A, a These are industry experts who have uh, money 
and corporate money and, and regulations in mind first. These, there are a lot of independent experts who totally disagree with that, and they weren't, vet, they weren't put on this panel. There's a lot of good um, data that, that shows that the exposures these people are assuming are much lower than what the people in Japan really got. Now, if you assume a low exposure, then of course you're going to have low cancer rates. But I did those calculations for a living, and there's a series of guesses that the industry is making. And of course, the industry is making all the lowball estimates to get the number down as low as possible. There's a lot of good science coming out, and, and will continue to come out. We'll have it up on our site um, that shows that uh, concentrations of cesium and, and strontium and all are a lot higher than the industry quote experts are um, are assuming. Um, the um, the secret is in the assumptions. If you use low ball assumptions, you're going to get low ball doses. If you go back and really look at the appropriate assumptions, then it's uh, an entirely different analysis. And need I ask why they would use low ball assumptions? There's money. A, there's money. a lot of money here. Yeah. And and also the the continuation of the nuclear power right. industry. Right. Now, the um, there are 54 nuclear power plants in Japan, and 52 are closed down. I, th I believe I read while well, you were in Japan, Arnie, that they opened up two, or they had the go-ahead to, uh, to reopen two of the nuclear power plants? Well, they've done something called a stress test, and two of the power plants have, quote, passed the stress test. Um, and that's, frankly, that's a joke. Um, the stress test basically, Fukushima could have passed the stress test on March 10th. And it failed on March 11th when reality knocked on the door. Um, the same thing is true for all these power plants. They're just looking to see if they're designed as they were designed. And they're all passing the stress test. In fact, though, uh, the, the, if a tsunami is worse than was anticipated, they're not looking at things like loss of the ultimate heat sink and um, uh, extended loss of ultimate uh, of, of off-site power. Um, so the stress test is a... Um, is a placebo to make the Japanese feel better about starting the nuclear units up. And, and the Japanese aren't buying it. The, um, at the root of the problem is the regulator. And we talk about that in, in, in the report. Um, you and, call it a regula regulatory capture. What is that? Uh, well, I mean, you know, that's, if, if that's along the lines of what you were just saying, right? The, um, yes. The, um, the regulator, in this case NISA, N-I-S-A, is run by an organization called META, META, and that's a trade uh, cabinet position. So the Ministry, regulator- Ministry of Energy, Technology, um, Agent, I think it's minist Ministry Energy Technology Agency or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the trade association manages the regulator. And of course, Tokyo Electric applies pressure at the trade association level, and none of the regulators' um, um, regulations ever really have any teeth because of that. Um, it's no different here. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, Congress puts all sorts of pressure on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, uh, uh, to go easy on nuclear utilities as well. This recent hearing where um, some of the commissioners were upset with the chairman, that made it to a congressional hearing. But what you don't hear is that the ringleader of that, uh, uh, Commissioner Magwood, um, before he took a job as an NRC commissioner, worked for Tokyo Electric. And now he's chastising the, the, the chairman for being too tough. Is, so this commissioner, this American Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, commissioner, Mm -hmm. Commissioner Magwood. Mag Magwood worked for Tokyo Electric, which is, I suppose, not just a Japanese company, but a global company. Right. Is that it? Yeah. He's a, he, was a, he ran a consulting company, and Tokyo Electric was his client. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure w w in, in what capacity, but Huffington Post did a big piece on it. Um, Commissioner Magwood was objected to by 100 different environmental organizations. Uh, they basically in his felt appointment. They basically felt his appointment was the worst appointment ever for an NRC commissioner. And the uh, Senate and the House unanimously accepted him anyway. That gives you an idea of the pressure that the nuclear utilities put on Congress. So to claim that we're any better than the Japanese. Unanimously? 
unanimous consent. You mean our own congressional de delegation participated in his endorsement? It was unanimous consent. And I don't think that means a vote. I think if you don't disagree, it goes through. Nobody disagreed. Well, that's shocking. I think that we need to have some meetings here in Vermont with uh, Congressman Welsh and uh, Senator Sanders and Leahy. That's okay. It's, well, playing the, it's playing the corporate game. Definitely. It's playing right into it. And uh, Commissioner Magwood also wanted to be head of the commission. Isn't that so? Yeah, this is he something did. that I read last December. Yes. Yes. Behind the scenes, that? behind the yeah. scenes, the industry was saying, "Well, you don't have to throw Chairman Yasko out. Just make him a commissioner and put Commissioner Magwood in as chairman." So they wanted to revolve the the position. So, yeah, the guy that a hundred environmental organizations opposed, the industry was lobbying to put in charge of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they almost got their way. Yeah, and when he didn't get his way. Then that was that whole fiasco where he went to Congress with the other commissioners, three of the other commissioners, so four of them, against commission, uh, Chairman Yasko, and they tried to have him removed because they said that he was blocking industry initiatives. Yes, and in the meantime, they found time to give a 20-year extension to Energy Vermont Yankee here in Vermont, and they're going around giving oh, there's, extensions. There's shock on that one, right? On the extension for Vermont Yankee in terms of the NRC, those behind-the-scene hmm. notes that came out? Yeah. Tell us about that. <laughs> well, of course, the accident occurred on the uh, 11th, and the uh, NRC was about ready to relicense uh, Vermont Yankee for another... Um, um, another 20 years, and they put it off for a couple of, couple of days, um, and they wanted, to, I think within the NRC, they wanted to see if there were any lessons that applied, but another commissioner whose name I can't pronounce, it starts with an S and there's a V in it, and um, uh, anyway, one of the uh, women commissioners on the, on the NRC commission said, you know, no, it's not going to happen. We've, we've licensed this, it's going through. So on the 16th, five days after the accident, Vermont Yankee got its license. Um, even though on the 12th, we've also found an NRC email saying that the Mark I containment, which is what Vermont Yankee has, is the worst containment in the world. And then there was the inside internal email that surfaced said, well, was between the commission and the staff. And is that, does this mean that the staff is going to reapprise um, Vermont Yankee and some of the other plants, Mar the uh, Mark I BWRs, in light of the issues at Fukushima? No, this just means we're holding off for political expediency, basically, is what it said. Mm -hmm. That we're just holding off right now until, until the tenor calms down a little bit. Going back to the topic, an accident waiting to happen, these are all uh, horribly shocking things that, that have, uh, have been going on in, in after Fukushima and before it. And uh, many people also think that um, our nuclear power reactors here in the United States are accidents ready to happen. Mm -hmm. And your expertise on that Mark I goes back to uh, over 40 years ago. It, this, is, this is just uh, terrible. And, and at the same time, uh, things are going on, it seems the same as. Like, for example, uh, there was an agreement between England and France recently, the two leaders, Sarkozy and uh, the uh, Prime Minister of England uh, agreed on Arriva, on, mm -hmm. on bringing in a more Arriva nuclear power reactors to England. And uh, so th they seem to be going in lockstep into the future with, without any kind of a, uh, a conscience about what has happened in, in Japan. You know, it, it, it just takes, a, it's a, you need to look at the future with a different paradigm than the past. And I think all the political leaders in the West think we need these huge power plants. But the, the paradigm's different now. The, the, um, with distributed power and with smart grids, we, can, we don't need huge power plants that are far away from cities. We can have distributed generation that's in the city or near the city 
that actually reduces the amount of, um, of, of total power consumption because you don't have all the power line losses and things like that. But our leaders are so locked in to these um, one, the huge companies that make these power plants um, and pay their campaign contributions that they um, um, are stuck in the model of building huge power plants uh, that cost $20 billion. Yeah, one of the guests on this Nuclear Free Future conversation was an Indian activist, uh, Ms. Patel, uh, who was telling us about the largest uh, computer re nuclear reactor in the world, which was being built in this rural area and uh, decimating the mango plantations, and also mm -hmm. people who are being killed and their, their land is being taken over by eminent domain there by the government because the government is sponsoring the nuclear power reactors in India. So this is another example of things going on, same as and, and worse. And also, uh, I believe somebody questioned you uh, after our last program about Bill Gates being involved in, um, in, yes. uh, in, in the nuclear power industry now. And, uh, we, we did check that, Arnie, and you and I about it, and uh, he's, he's pushing the depleted uranium nuclear power, power reactors and also doing the research and development with, with China. Well, he's also so. doing these small reactors, these small modular reactors, and he's supporting that concept. So, uh, you know, you too can have one in your backyard, Margaret, you know, mm. little communities and towns that would want to have them could have them. One of the things, you know, when we look at, at stuff in the U.S., um, Daily Coast had an article today um, about a plant in South Carolina that uh, sits below a dam, and the d or it's an earthen dam that is, is failing. And the NRC, which rarely gets concerned about anything, is very concerned about this dam, and below it, sits um, four nuclear plants and you know here are these reactors below it and if the dam fails it would cause a, a 32 foot tsunami a wave that would come down and flood over this four foot wall that protects these plants downriver so you know over and over again we hear the industry say oh, we can't have a tsunami in in this country but we can, and you know, this accident ha in at Fukushima and the and it is still accidents waiting to happen in this country because the regulator hasn't done its job and the industry is not proactive. And I don't think it ever will be. Yeah, we've come up with um, a couple reports on our website. One is um, about the the bolts on top of the nuclear reactor getting. Um, Overpressurized and the, actually the containment and and and, and lifting. Um, that's something the industry has known about for 40 years. Another report we had on the website is the at the bottom of the nuclear reactor, on a boiling water reactor, there's about 70 holes, and the likelihood of a melt through on a boiling water reactor, like Vermont Yankee, like Fukushima, is enormously more than any other reactor out there of the pressurized design. So we've known that since the 80s. And we just came up with another report on our website um, that talks about the electrical wires that go through the containment. The containment's not this monolithic thing. You've got to get electricity in, and you've got to get electrical signals out. And f since 1982, they've said that it's likely on the Mark I containment that those electrical penetrations will fail and the containment will fail. All this stuff is not news from Fukushima. It's been 1970s and 1980s. Well, we've known it for 30 years. Are you optimistic about the Japanese people and how they're handling this disaster? No, no. I, I mean, there's people, the, the, the publisher, Shueisha, who came to us for this book, they wanted to do this book and they approached us. They are part of a group that is really concerned about the future of Japan. But there are equally many, many people, as Arnie and our daughter who, who went with him found out over there, there are many, many people who just say, please don't talk about it. We don't want to know. The government tells us it's OK. And uh, next month, they're allowing people to move back into within 23 kilometers of 
the plant and two cities are reopening even though those areas still have high radiation exposures. You know, they still trust their government. So that's one piece, that's a part of the Japanese culture. And the other piece of it is that they, um, they buy into the old paradigm, we need these big nuclear plants. Now, the, to, to the Germans' credit, they said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna remove these. Over the next 10 years, we're getting rid of these big nuclear plants. So they broke the paradigm. And of course, once you do that, you're sort of, you become an atheist, essentially. And um, um, the Japanese can do that too. They can say, you know, over the next 10 years, or right now, or whatever, we're not gonna use nukes. But they're, um, they're being told by Tokyo Electric and their government that, oh my God, the world is gonna end if we don't have them. Um, in fact, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough one way or the other, and it's tough now, thank you, Fukushima. So that um, the, the net effect is that they, uh, they have a choice to move forward with a new paradigm and potentially make a lot of money selling it to the rest of the world or they can buy into the old paradigm and go back into making nuclear power plants. That was why we chose the title of the book. It's the truth and the future. They've got an alternative in the future um, to buy into a new energy paradigm and become a, a dynamic industrial powerhouse if they want. Now they can be the cutting edge in the world economy. And with that, we'll, we'll close this, this portion of our, our discussions and I hope that you will come back again at some Definitely. point when you, when you do have time to do it. And uh, we're, you were going to show a, a Fairwinds video about the containment that failed before the venting. So could you tell us a little bit about that? And, uh, but, uh, and, and just tell us about it. Sure. We'll um, the Union of Concerned Scientists um, um, was aware um, way back when the accident happened that the containment pressure went up and then went down and nobody could figure out why it went down because the containment vent had not been open. Well, I did some research on that as well and um, determined that the bolts that hold these two pieces together on the containment were actually stretching because the pressure was so high, the top was separating from the bottom. Now, this is 40-year-old data. The industry's known about it, and uh, yet um, everyone seems surprised that uh, suddenly um, it's, it's out there in public. So what we were able to do is take um, Union Concerned Scientist data, uh, data after the accident, some photographic evidence after the accident, then put it together in a nine minute video to explain just this one type of containment flaw that um, it's just one piece of the Mark I puzzle. Okay, thank you very much, Arnie Gunderson. Thank you very much, Maggie Gunderson. Mm -hmm. And uh, please come back and uh, we'll get through March with the, and could, could you tell us something about March 11th, where you will be? Um, well, Arnie's doing a couple um, audio presentations, one in Vancouver, um, well, TV, it's a TV presentation, one in Vancouver, and then we're also doing a live presentation in Brattleboro that day. And, and uh, so that's at, I think, 5 p.m. And we're also um, working with um, a woman uh, who lives here in Vermont, but who uh, was born and raised in Japan and still travels frequently back to Japan. She's there now. And she'll be talking about how people in Japan really feel and we'll be talking about the technical aspects of the accident. Thank you very much, You're Maggie. You're very welcome. Thank, thank you, you, Arnie. And thank you, viewers. And until next time, as we go toward a nuclear-free future. Thank you for having us, Mark. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. I've been thinking a lot lately about what happened in the first day of a nuclear accident at Fukushima. And I think I've come up with some interesting information that I wanted to share with you. The, the facility at, at, at Fukushima was one of the largest nuclear reactors in the world. And I'm sure you've seen the, the videos of it when, uh, when it was functioning, and it's truly an impressive um, facility. Well, Everyone has also seen the, uh, the pictures of the facility after the explosions. And in that period of a couple days, it went from a several billion dollar asset 
to a hundreds of billion dollar liability. And I believe it's the uh, single biggest industrial accident in the history of the world. But I wanted to focus on what happened after the tsunami, but before the explosions. And I think there's some important information that can be gleaned from the historical record. I need to go back and, and talk a little bit about um, uh, nuclear fundamentals for a minute here, though. The nuclear reactor sits inside a nuclear containment. Now, the containment is, um, uh, we've shown before, and, and the one that's uh, on the screen now is the um, Browns Ferry nuclear reactor. The top of that containment has a lid on it, and it's connected by many, many bolts. So now I'm going to use a, a tea infuser here to explain it another way. This is the containment. The nuclear reactor sits inside the containment. And then that lid gets screwed to the top so that if there is an accident and a, and a pipe breaks inside the nuclear containment, in theory, all of the contaminated gases stay inside that containment. Well, it's been known for a long time that the Mark I reactor is a very small reactor containment. And uh, as a result, back in the 80s, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission added a vent to it. And the reason for that is that engineers didn't understand when they built this unit that hydrogen gases could build up after an accident. Well, that's exactly what happened at Fukushima. At Fukushima, the, the uh, nuclear reactor was uncooled, and the nuclear fuel became very hot and reacted with the water to create hydrogen gas. Now, the data for the first day of the accident is, uh, is troubling, to say the least. The, the data, as, as I've been able to put it together, is um, uh, pretty complicated, but we'll work our way through it here. The, the, this is a multi-column table. The first column is the time and the day. But what I'm interested in is the fourth column over. And that table is in um, uh, pascals, which is a measure of pressure. I'm going to convert those uh, to, to pounds per square inch, which most of us are much more comfortable talking about. At the bottom of the table is right before the accident, and the pressure was atmospheric. And what that means, 0.1, is normal pressure, 14.5 pounds per square inch. Then the tsunami came, the plant lost its power, and the next data point is about eight hours later. Because remember now, most of the, um, most of the components were, uh, didn't have electricity, so most of these readings were unavailable. Well, at two in the morning, the pressure inside the containment was almost nine times higher. That means it was about 125 pounds per square inch. This containment wasn't designed for 125 pounds per square inch. If you look a little further, though, by 9.30 in the morning, the pressure starts to drop. And for the next seven hours, the pressure's much lower than it was at 2 in the morning. So the question is, how could it be that the pressure in the afternoon was lower than the pressure in the early morning? Remember, there's a violent chemical reaction going on inside the nuclear reactor where all sorts of hydrogen gas is being generated. Well, one possible reason for the lower containment pressure is that the containment vent was open. But that hadn't happened yet. So what made the pressure drop down? One possibility, I believe, to be the case is something that happened 40 years ago at a plant called the Brunswick plant in North Carolina. Now, the nuclear industry in the U.S., the IAEA, the Japanese are all aware of this, but they're all ignoring this test and pretending that it didn't happen. What happened 40 years ago was this. When a containment was, was pressurized, it was pressurized to just about 100 pounds, and then something really strange and unexpected happened. The top, the head of the containment, began to lift off of the bottom of the containment. 
getting back to my, my uh, mug here, what happened was that the bolts that hold the top to the bottom began to stretch. And the top lifted and allowed the gases to slide out. That held the pressure in here at 100 pounds, even though gases were being pumped in. Now, this was not an accident. This was pressurized with normal air. It was a test. But the containment at Brunswick began to leak at around 100 pounds per square inch. Let's look at that table again from Fukushima. Where did Fukushima settle out at? Just about 100 pounds per square inch. What that tells me is that the head of the containment lifted up and gases began to sneak out into the reactor building, which is that box that surrounds it, well before the containment vent was even opened. Now, another photograph of the site right before the explosion clearly shows that the containment vent was open. You'll see the stack on the, on the right of this picture, and it has steam coming out the top, smoke coming out the top. What that is is it's highly radioactive gases and water vapor, and it's creating that steam. So we know that right before the explosion, the containment vent was working. Now, the Japanese are saying, well, the containment vent was working, but the, the pipes were somehow or other leaking hydrogen into the plant as well, and that's what caused the explosion. To my way of thinking, the data doesn't support the interpretation of the nuclear industry and the Japanese. What the data does support is the Brunswick test from 40 years ago. It seems to me that for eight hours or more, the containment at Fukushima was basically ruptured, that the top had popped up and gases were sliding out so that it couldn't go over 100 pounds per square inch. And hydrogen gases were leaking into the containment, out of the containment, and into the reactor building for a long period of time. After that, it only took a spark to blow the, con to blow the reactor building up. This is a really important distinction. The nuclear industry, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Japanese are saying that we can make the vent stronger so that this, this accident can't happen. But if the nuclear head is lifting up, the vent is irrelevant. The containment on the Mark I design has a design flaw that the containment vent can't solve. Whether or not the nuclear reactor containment at Fukushima maintained its integrity is a critical question to the operating fleet of BWR reactors throughout the world. I'll be working on some more information over the next week, and we'll have another video up shortly. Thank you very much. I'll keep you informed.